Good morning and welcome. It's good to have the chance <clears throat> to speak with all of you. Um, so thank you for chronicling the last decade of what Mayo Clinic's been doing as we've been navigating this uncertain world that we're in, the Great Recession, all the changes in, uh, in, in the external world and the advances of technology and medical research. Um, so we appreciate that very much, and if you have questions today, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm pleased to say that these last uh, nine and a half years have gone very well from my perspective uh, from Mayo Clinic and our, and our efforts to serve our patients. As you know, we're driven by our values. Every decision we make is, is based on the Franciscan and founding values of the Mayo Clinic and our effort to meet the needs of our patients. When I took over this a little over nine years ago, Mayo Clinic was a holding company with large campuses in Arizona, Florida, and of course the upper Midwest. And our goal was to come together as a single organization, a single operating company with one set of goals, one strategy, one operating plan, one set of missions, uh, one set of one mission and uh, one, uh, one founding value, and move together so that we could serve our patients uh, better. And over this, Nine and a half years, as Carl said, the organization has continued to grow and be successful. We are having better patient outcomes, better safety, better quality, um, better patient satisfaction, more research productivity. Our educational efforts have grown. Our staff satisfaction is strong, and um, our finances have been strong, which allow us as a not-for-profit to invest in research, education, the practice, our people, and of course in the community. That's what not for profit healthcare organizations do. <clears throat> We've grown our destination practice, you know a lot about that in Rochester, but also on the campuses in uh, Florida and Arizona, which are now coming into their own as very high quality, top rated in their state and in the region, the healthcare organizations with vibrant research education practice. And patients are migrating from around the world, around the country to those sites as well. In addition, we have our community practice, our footprint across the upper Midwest that you know about, and that is doing well and continuing to evolve and change and face uh, the issues that are faced in rural healthcare in America. Uh, so it's been a, a very good run, um, and I very much look forward to your questions. So when you ask a question, you can just identify yourself and your organization. So go ahead. Well, I think Mayo Clinic is in a stronger position than it's been in the past. I think we've been able to do that because we've focused on, as I said, the founding Franciscan and our founders' values to make those decisions. Um, that's important in healthcare where everyone is basically serving the public, serving others. That's allowed us to change, make those changes, and be successful. So we have a stronger organization. That will help us for whatever lies ahead in healthcare as, as things change. Um, there are, there's a lot more work to do. There are some unanswered questions in American healthcare, the biggest one being accessibility and affordability and sustainability of the healthcare system in the country. Uh, we can talk about that. That's a big challenge. That involves patients with serious and complex illness, which is what Mayo Clinic is, um, excels in. But of course it also, country is going to have to face the issues of urban and rural health, healthcare delivery, access, sustainability, that sort of thing. And that's around the corner. I think we're well positioned to respond to that. Um, there's a lot Mayo Clinic can do, but society basically has to make a decision. Does America want to have an affordable, uh, accessible, sustainable, high quality healthcare system? And that's, a, that's a national decision. That's a societal decision. And at the moment, that has not been the top priority in the United States. It just hasn't been. Uh, we're, we're locked into these two-year election cycles where we're going to do this or we're going to do that and back and forth. And it's a very narrow look at full spectrum of health and health care. I think when the country decides that's a priority for its citizens, uh, Mayo Clinic will continue to do what it's always done, and that's provide our best advice, our best perspective on how that can be done.
Thank you. Um, my fondest memory at Mayo Clinic is the work the people do every day. Being, the best part of being the CEO of Mayo Clinic is you have a view across the entire organization in the Upper Midwest and the other destination sites. And our devoted, outstanding staff provide great care. And I hear about that all the time from patients as well as from the staff. We have the same kind of story happening all the time in this community. We hear a lot about what the people of Rochester and in the region do, especially for those patients who travel from so far away. We have patients coming from 140 countries in all 50 states, and they all say the same thing. Rochester and its surroundings made me feel welcome, not threatened, and that relationship with Rochester, I think it's very strong. I've always thought so. I actually think it's stronger than it's ever been. And I'm very, very pleased for that and proud for that and grateful to the community. It's just a wonderful place for us to be. Uh, and I live here every day, so I see it. At DC with PIT, yeah. uh, among the, the key accomplishments that, that were laid out for us uh, in your time here, is there anything that you think that you would say you're the most proud of or anything that sticks out as something that, uh, that you know? So, we are now performing as a single organization, and it's, it's big. It contributes $30, million, $30 billion to the American economy, and it creates an extra job or two for every job we have. So, so when you work as a single organization, and you're driven by your values, you make good decisions, everybody's trying to do the same thing, you have better outcomes. And we are there now, DD. We are, we are there as a single organization, and that allows us to continue to improve the quality of our care patient experience, and advanced research and advanced education. Those three shields are all doing good work to meet the needs of our patients, to build the workforce of tomorrow, and to basically find answers to patients' unmet needs through research. So when you all line up together, you know, the, the problem, you want to go fast, go alone, you want to go far, go with others, that plays out every single day at the Mayo Clinic. We all work together. The patients notice it, usually within a few minutes of coming here from, from away. There's something different about this place. It's different in the community. The community here knows that we have lots of visitors and they treat them kindly from the airport, from the parking lot, all the way through their experience in the community. They come into the clinic and they realize people at Mayo Clinic only work here for one purpose, and that's to serve others. And we focus on that and they appreciate that. So when you're all united by your values and united as an organization, how can we do this better, faster, stronger for our patients? It works, and then all good things happen after that. Whether they're scientific, medical, business, doesn't matter. Good things happen. People have good jobs, more jobs, more job growth, more permanence in the community. Keep young people in the community. That's good for, for, for our communities. So, again, I'm very proud of where we are. I think we're quite healthy. Tom, I'm going to post bulletin. Uh, mentioned some of your frustrations with the American medical system. You did your training in Canada. Yep. The Canadians love their system. Probably because it's not American. But uh, <laughs> um, what can we learn from them? What can we? Well, Tom, them? you know, I think Canadians are very proud of their healthcare system. Um, uh, it's it's evolved since I last worked there, so I'm not an expert on the Canadian healthcare system. Um, but that said. Um, they're, they're proud of it until they get sick. And the fact is, there are, there are fewer resources, there are longer waiting lines, there is less investment in research, there is less bringing of, of technology to the practice as a nation because it's a single payer system, essentially. Now, there is supplementation from insurance, but you get something, you give something up. What I was saying earlier, if, may, if the country decides it wants a sustainable, high-quality healthcare system, you can't have those gaps. You can have accessibility, absolutely, but you also have to have sustainability. It has to be affordable. You also have to bring in new technology and new research advances without waiting lines. That solution has, has evaded all Western societies. Canada has the strength of overall coverage. That's a very good thing. Mayo Clinic very much wants our patients to all have health care access. But it comes up, if you do that and you can't afford that, then you have to cut corners somewhere else. So when I mentioned that this is a societal decision, it's going to take 
voices from the patient, the providers, the insurance companies, the device companies, the pharmaceutical companies, but also transportation, education, all of those other sectors have to come together and say, how do we have a healthcare system that keeps people healthy, that people are not denied service, that have outstanding outcomes, and that have access to the latest cutting edge research that is being developed right here in America. I mean, that's an economic engine for the country. That, there is a solution in there, but it will come at a cost. And at the moment, the society hasn't, 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 hasn't sorted that out. Um, other, I'm not here to talk in great lengths about other countries, but they all have strengths, but they all come up short. No one has this figured out yet, but it's a problem worth solving. What advice would you give to the next CEO? So we're fortunate at Mayo Clinic in that the physician who is asked to lead the Mayo Clinic is an internal person, a person who we've known, who we know well, who grasps and conveys Mayo values. And that allows the CEO transition to be seamless and smooth. We know these people. Dr. Fruge has been at Mayo for 30 years. He was in Rochester for 26 years. He understands Mayo. He's respectful of Mayo. He's extremely bright and hardworking. He's a fine physician, a fine researcher, an entrepreneur, and he is a, um, he's committed to the future, and he's a futuristic thinker. Um, my advice to him would be, listen well, listen often, understand the community, understand the people of Mayo, and help convey the next step of where we're going so people are behind him and support him and understand the purpose and the context of it. Speaking to, speaking to the public, I think, and through media, I try to do this. Mayo is physician-led. Uh, the voice of the physician is important in healthcare. And I have said to Dr. Fruja, use your physician voice. Let people know that you care for patients. You do research in disease that's helping patients. You're not an administrator. Um, we have strong administrators. So you have to be good at administration. But speak about the patient. Because if, if we're physician-led and the physician understands the patients, we will get, make better decisions as an organization. Steve Lang, Rochester Steve. Magazine. So what kind of advice did your predecessor, Dr. Cortese, give you that resonated with you? Dr. Cortese gave me a very strong message. Stay close to the people of Mayo Clinic. Care for the people of Mayo Clinic. Look after the people of Mayo Clinic. And that was fantastic advice. If you're CEO of an organization that has 65,000 employees and 35,000 contracted employees, you have 100,000 people, it's like a city. And it's pretty, it's pretty easy to be separated from the day to day. You have to understand their perspective. You have to, as much as possible, walk in their shoes. And Dr. Cortese made it clear to me that that was a very important message and I've done my best to follow. Uh, Ken David, yes, KRC Radio. This should be a good segue here. I was wondering um, the handling of the situation in Albert Lee and the food service workers here. Um, I don't know if you're directly involved or indirectly involved, but do you have any thoughts on how those situations Yeah, I'll talk about the I-90 corridor and how that goes. That's a very fair question. For years, and it was getting worse, Kim, we were having trouble having a sustainable, high-quality workforce that we could predict, that we could predict that we knew we'd have enough nurses, physicians, pharmacists, technicians, that sort of thing, to adequately and safely staff those two hospitals. We were having trouble for years recruiting that workforce that could be there, that would be a Mayo Clinic workforce. And so we had to pay local tenants and other itinerant healthcare workers to fill in the gaps if we didn't have our staff that we could count on to be there. And that's piecemeal, it's not high quality care, and the other thing that happens is you come up short on that. And when you come up short on that, all of a sudden, oh my goodness, we're going to have to transfer this patient to Rochester or that patient to Austin. And that's not good for patient care. It's not high quality, it's not safe, it's expensive, it doesn't make any sense. So the Albert Lee Austin situation was entirely a workforce issue. So we asked our, our team to go off and study this and come up with an answer. They spent 18 months looking at it from every aspect. 
and they came back with a very, in my opinion, an elegant analytical answer. We need to consolidate services so patients that, will, that we can staff predictably and the patients will have better safety and better outcome. The downside of that, there's always a trade-off, it's always a balance, is we can't have every service in both hospitals. That was the right answer, and it's proven to be the right answer. But here's what happened. That decision was, that makes good sense. It's good analytical sense. How do we share with the community? And we had considerable community engagement, but not at the time of the final solution. So the decision was made, well, you better tell your staff about it first, because that's your first loyalty, the people, your employees. And I wasn't involved in that decision, but it made sense to the people. And of course, they talked to the staff and said, there are going to be some changes. And within minutes, that became news. And so we hadn't, we hadn't engaged the community adequately. That was bad on us. It was our mistake. We didn't do it. We learned from that. I think our community engagement efforts have been stronger. Now, it turned out, and where we are today is there haven't been layoffs. We've invested heavily in Albert Lee and Austin. The quality and safety and predictability of the care is better, but they're still separated. And there, we did not handle that well. I take full accountability for that. But it was the right answer. It's been a good answer. And we're, 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 we're continuing to invest in those communities. They're strong. And nobody lost their job. Now, if we hadn't done that, we would have been in a, in a, in a much different situation. But it was, it was a good case study of the importance of engaging the community in a decision that impacts them. And that was our mistake. Yeah. Uh, Sean Baker, Vince uh, During your tenure, Mayo has ramped up his efforts to support physicians in research and entrepreneurship, uh, and also through the investment in Discovery Square. It's led to a number of promising startups. So I have two questions for you. If you could just explain why in the 21st century Mayo values uh, entrepreneurship here in Rochester, and then how do we keep those startups local? Uh, Call the Garbage site is one of the examples yeah. of the fact that went out. They're now based in Madison. How do we keep that uh, investing? Great in question, Sean. Sure. Great question. So our founders were entrepreneurial. And if you watch the Ken Burns film, you'll see the innovations that they brought in, both from themselves, but from physicians all over the world. And they had adjusted them, adapted them, refined them, and improved them. That entrepreneurial spirit was very, very strong. And it, and, it, and it continued through Mayo, the CAT scan, the unified medical record, the heart lung machine, the blood bank, I mean, lots of advances, the Nobel Prize, I mean, lots of good things happen. But, as a single organization salary model, where all of us are salaried, and we still are, we, were, we perhaps the organization overcorrected and said we are all equal. Well, we are all equal. We're all paid the same, but there are different types of workers. And we were falling behind, I felt, in our entrepreneurship efforts. And our, our policies and our environment was not fostering entrepreneurial activity. So good ideas were leaving the organizations. And you know how this goes. Entrepreneurs think differently. And if they're in an organization that's not creating a culture and fostering it, they'll go somewhere else. So in 2011, um, I said to my team, I want to foster entrepreneurship. We've got to be at the cutting edge of that. We can't farm that out. And we should be able to scale that, given the size and the creativity of mail. So that, that was difficult, in a sense, because it meant changing a lot of our policies. Because if we're all the same, what do you mean all of a sudden someone is going to be a physician entrepreneur? He has a huge upside. What if he's successful? Or what if he fails? Will he accept that risk? And how does Mayo allow that to happen without fragmenting what has kept us together? So it's been a little bit tricky. We've, we've um, I think we've done a great job of that. And as you said, our output of intellectual property and company spinoffs and, and new technologies and bringing in other investments has really taken off the last five or six years, which allows us then to build Discovery Square and bring in outside investors to do that. Um, if you do that too much, you will lose your focus on your values, that we're, one of which is respect for each other, in t uh, innovation, sure, but within some confined framework. I think we've navigated that very well. We've realized that entrepreneurship is where we came from, 
and entrepreneurship is part of where we're going. Now, as you said, about half the companies, perhaps more, have left either Rochester or Minnesota altogether uh, because of the environment is better in that community or that community. So we need to come together in the Midwest and say, what keeps entrepreneurs and startup companies local? How do we do that? And there are, there are a host of issues, taxation issues, regulatory issues, size of the entrepreneurship community, wel how welcoming it is with a university or with Mayo Clinic. Do you have the workforce for it? Do you have the students for it? And we're working on all those areas, all those areas to create a solution that will foster entrepreneurship and keep the products of that locally for the people of Minnesota. Thanks so much. Um, I've decided not to go back into the practice. Uh, that's an option for a retiring CEO at Mayo Clinic. I'm a neurologist. I've been out of the practice for a decade. I think the field has moved on. I've kept up with it, but I think it's. Uh, I think those. I've had the, those days. So I am going to retire. Uh, Mayo leaders do not advance to be the chair of the board or the executive chairman. That doesn't happen. If you don't go back to the practice or back to research, you leave Mayo Clinic. So I will be leaving Mayo Clinic as an employee on the 1st of January. Um, I'm very, we're very fortunate. We have family in the area, grandchildren in the area, and nobody wants to leave their grandchildren, so we're going to stay here. We love it here. Uh, in terms of what I do next, um, I will begin to look at that once I leave this job. As a fiduciary of Mayo, I cannot accept or develop business relationships or other relationships until my fiduciary duties are finished. And as you might imagine, Word gets out that the president and CEO, CEO of Mayo is going to retire, and there's interest in what I might do to help healthcare going forward. Uh, if I do that, it will be in an environment where I feel I can bring the voice of the patient and the voice of the medical profession to make that effort more successful. Um, that's what drives me, and if I do something, that's what it will be. Are you going to pick up the guitar again? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I'm actually going to start piano. Okay. I have music, music in my family. I've always wanted to play the piano. I've never done it, and it's now or never, actually, quite frankly, Steve. So. And you don't still have your Fender Super Champ amplifier? I, my son does. Okay. Uh, he doesn't use it, but uh, thanks. That's a pretty good piece of, yeah, I was a terrible guitarist, but my sons are very good. <laughs> yep, Terry's in Terry Terry, right? Is it that, yeah, that's Mark Noseworthy. That's, uh, he goes under that name. He's a professional musician, film score writer in Los Angeles. Good, good research. You know, we hear quite a bit about DMC yeah. and some of these other initiatives that Mayo has been involved in and still evolving and so on. But I know there are two projects that, because you were in charge of Mayo at the time, and you have to feel pretty good about the renovation of Mailwood and then Sissy Heights. Thank you very I mean, much. They were really in need of help and they weren't getting it. Yeah, so thanks very much for that question. So, the home of Dr. Charles Mayo, um, Mailwood was not owned by Mayo Clinic. The Historical Society just didn't have the cash flow to keep it up. And we partnered with them and have invested heavily in that. And that's been a really good thing. It's gorgeous, it's a huge part of our past, and it's open um, a majority of the time to the public, as it should be. And it's, uh, it's worth a, a trip out there if you haven't been to it. Uh, same with the CC Heights. It's a jewel for our community. And our relationship with the Sisters of St. Francis has always been and remains very strong. They are, they are an essential part of our past and of our, and of our future. Tom, you had a question? For the philosophical question, I guess. You know, we talk about science and medicine all the time, but we also talk about practicing medicine, which makes it sound like art. <laughs> How does that all work out? Is your so science is, uh, pardon me, medicine is both an art and a science. There's no question about it. And that will be tested in the next generation because technology is advancing so quickly, as you know. If you ask a physician, such as myself, I think we would feel that technology can make us better doctors. I don't believe, at least in the next lifetime, uh, for those alive today, I honestly don't think the medical profession will disappear. I actually think the humanism of, and the art side of it, the experience side of it, uh, will be enabled by artificial intelligence, robotics, microchips, nanotechnology, all that kind of thing. Um, but, I, but there is an art 
to practicing medicine. And the question I always ask patients is, do you, do you like your doctor? Do you feel comfortable with, with your doctor? Can you trust your doctor? Can you, can you tell what you really need to tell your doctor? And if they say yes to all those, they should keep that doctor. If they don't, they should try to get a new doctor, because that's the doctor's role. It's the nurse's role to create that feeling of connection, people to people, trust, um, secrets, that sort of thing that you need to, to do. I don't think we're going to get there. Artificial intelligence is going to help us tremendously. It already is. We have a huge effort in machine learning and artificial intelligence at Mayo Clinic um, that, that supports us to make better decisions from a business standpoint, from a workflow standpoint, also from a research and practice standpoint. But we still have male physicians, and I think we will for a very long time, hopefully forever. How are you, how are you feeling, you know, sitting here talking about your career, you know, and your retirement, I guess, just kind of in the words? Well, I feel, I feel incredibly honored to have been a member of the voting staff of the Mayo Clinic. That's the highest honor I could ever achieve in my life. Literally, I just can't. I walk to work, every day I see the Mayo Clinic, I look and I say, I can't believe I have the privilege of working here. That just has never worn off in 28 years. This is a marvelous place to work. I'm pleased, I'm happy about that. I'm, I'm pleased and proud that Mayo's in a strong position. I have great confidence in my successor. I know Mayo's gonna do well. Um, if you said, you know, stick, stick around, you're 10 years younger, could you do it all? I'd do it all over again in a minute. Um, I'm gonna miss it, so it's bittersweet, but I've missed a lot of time with my family, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm focusing on looking forward, but when I look back, I feel very, very gratified to have had this privilege. It's been an enormous privilege to work here every single day. So why now? I mean, all of your sure. predecessors served kind of in that four to eight, nine, ten year range. Yeah. Is that by design? Is that something that- Yeah, so Mayo, Mayo has a rotational leadership tradition it's pretty much standard practice for physicians who have mid to high level management assignments. So a department chair or a dean, if you will. It's usually a renewable four-year term, potentially renewable four-year term. We've done that forever to bring in new people, new talent, uh, and keep the innovations coming. The CEO role, as you, as you mentioned, Steve, is essentially a one-year assignment that's renewable and based on performance uh, and an annual, a very um, significant detailed review of performance, I'll say. Um, you're asked to stay another year. Um, and as you said, my predecessors have, have stayed in this job for four, six, seven, eleven years, depending. Um, the time is perfect for Mayo right now to have that rotation. They asked me to stay on an additional year for the installation of the electronic health record, which is a big, that, that's a good thing to finish up on rather than saddle the new person with that because it's so disruptive. So I said I'd stay on another year. But my successor is ready and waiting and the organization is uh, ready for, uh, for a person who's gonna be investing hopefully another eight or 10 years. So the timing just seems right. Uh, during the documentary that came out uh, this past fall, Ken, uh, Ken Burns gave a great praise to the Mayo Clinic. I think we were here and he was asked about Mayo today, and he said his role as a historian is to look back 30, 40 plus years in the past. Uh, how do you think a historian will look back at the early part of the 21st century uh, for Mayo Clinic? Well, I don't know. I think um, if that person is driven by metrics of patient satisfaction, safety, quality, um, rankings, business development opportunities, uh, educational um, quality of the education, the output of our research, uh, and our finances, I would say they'd say this has been a good decade of tremendous change and the organization became stronger without um, in any way straying from its values. That's, that's my perspective. And I actually think the values and our commitment to our culture is why we're strong. So I'm hopeful that they will say that in spite of the Great Recession and all the tumultuous changes, social media, social unrest, two different administrations in Washington, all that stuff, 
um, that Mayo was a steady ship that navigated itself well and became stronger and advanced its mission to serve more patients and serve them more safely and with better creativity and, and better outcomes. So I think, I think this will be seen as a, as a strong decade. I hope so. Thank you very much for your interest and, and for all you've done the last decade in working with us and trying to help us tell our story. I really appreciate it. It's not an easy story to tell, but you've always done your very best to do that. I greatly respect what you do and I'm grateful for that. So thank you all. Have a good holiday. And uh, thanks for today. <laughs>